News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. And a wonderful morning to you. This is Newsline. Live as always from the News First studios in Dorset Street in Clamwell. And uh, this morning, uh, Newsline is still in pursuit of that almost elusive question, uh, well, the elusive answer to the question, why are we in darkness, in sporadic bouts of darkness? To help us try and understand that, uh, we have with us an energy specialist uh, who's uh, got a wonderful reputation before him, and that is Dr. Tilak Siemilapitya. Very good morning to you. Good morning to you, Faraz. So well, the, the question is, why do we have bouts of sporadic darkness? Bouts of sporadic darkness. Why it is sporadic yeah. is because it is disorganized. So uh, whenever we had blackouts, of course Sri Lanka have had blackouts or more respectably called the load shedding. Yeah. In my memory, 1979, 1983, 87, 92, 96, 2000, and 2001. Right. And part of 2002 also. Right. We had a very systematic timetable. So of power cuts. Of power cuts. So, right. so which means, of course, it's so unfortunate, but even when you have to do the most unfortunate, unpleasant thing, yeah. you do it in a systematic way. Right. But since 2007, we enjoyed uh, almost uh, free, load shedding free period, except for a uh, short interval in 2010. Mm. And it's in 2010, this, this habit of, you know, giving blackouts without informing and uh, different arms of the government and CEB uh, saying different things. Mm. And one party says, no, blackouts are not allowed. Mm. Now the Public Utilities Commission says, uh, you know, blackouts have to be approved by us. Mm. The minister says there will be no blackouts. Mm. But CEB says, unfortunately, blackouts have to be given. So the end result is that there is no timetable. There was no timetable until last week. But right. now there seems to be some kind of a schedule. But unfortunately, uh, it is still sporadic, but what is equally important is to examine as to why we got into this sad state of affairs. <coughs> yes, that's always helpful. Why, why is this? Because I, I asked a question uh, the other day as to why, what's happened to all our planners and so on. And I'm sure that the CEB have plenty of uh, uh, industrious and professional gentlemen and ladies um, who must be planning ahead uh, because they're professional people. I don't believe that these professional people sit down and drink endless cups of tea. No, uh, they, they, do produce, they do produce a good plan. Yeah. So uh, what happens to these plans? So according to the law, yeah. they have to produce a 20-year long-term plan right. and update it every year. According to the law? According to the Electricity Act. Okay. It's, it is stated in the Act, okay. right? So, plans are available and, you know, we can discuss about the plan in detail, but the plan is professionally prepared. Mm. And these people have been trained in the university for four and a half years and then on the job as well as international exposure and training. So, planning is an is a expert job. Mm. You and I feel that, uh, look, uh, Sri Lanka is surrounded by the ocean and mm. there is a lot of wind, a lot of waves, a lot of sunshine, mm. whether, you know, why should we have this kind of a problem? But then all of those technologies have their limitations. So, so power system planning and power system operation is a professional job. Unfortunately, a politician, particularly the ones in our country, are unable to understand the, the fundamentals of power system planning and operation. Is so, it also true to say, Doctor, that the politicians, because they are not specialists uh, and they're, you know, they're politicians and policies and all that, is it fair to say that there is also an element where the officials, official them, like the professionals of the CEB and so on, and at the ministry even, that they conspire to mislead and misdirect and under-inform whoever the minister in charge is? I cannot, uh, you know, cite specific instances, but there could be. Yeah. There could be, but then what is the officially approved plan is there on the table. Right. So the only question the minister should be asking is, 
are you implementing this plan what support do you need from the government and yeah. the political hierarchy to implement this plan mm -hmm. but for us what happens is something totally different which is what if we are to investigate why we for why we fell into this pit yeah. today yeah. we need to look at the uh, long term plan of year 2010 what did the plan of 2010 say about today yeah. why do i say we should look at 2010 plan rather than the 2015 plan yeah it takes about 8 to 10 years to build a large power plant. 8 to 10 years? 8 to 10 years. So how long did Norichole take? Norichole from the day it was proposed, in fact Norichole was first to be in Trincomalee. Yes. And then moved to the south. Yes, there was a lot of uh, Yes, of course, big power plants attract a lot of protest, particularly if the power plant produces electricity at a very low cost. Yeah. Then it attracts a lot of protest. So you can, you know, some of these protests but are these genuine. Protests, uh, I was about to say that to you. But average Joe public doesn't really know about the costs and so on. They, unless News First has done an expose on it. But no, that's tongue in cheek. But what I mean is that Joe public doesn't really know the cost. They will look at things like, oh, the sound and it's going to be dirty. There's going to be a lot of dust and there. Their plantations, their homes, their daily lives will be disruptive. So, who's fueling these protests? I can't say very clearly, yeah. but definitely there are genuine protests, and yeah. some some NGOs file court cases. Yeah. So, it is up to the CEB and the politician behind the the government structure yeah. to address these concerns rather than run away and cancel the power plants, mm. because cancelling the power plants is in fact the habit of various governments. If you consider Norachole, it has been, the site has been moved from Trincomalee to Mawalda to Norachole uh, over the period 1987 to 1992. Mm. So, site change. Then uh, it fell dormant, the feasibility study was done. Mm. Then it was approved and cancelled about 10 times by the government of 94 to year 2000. So you approve, you cancel. You approve, you cancel. One politician promises to do it. The other politician promises not to do it. Then the previous politician also promises not to do it. Cancelled. Then in 2002, Norachole fully cancelled. You call the Prime Minister, call the Japanese ambassador and say, we don't need your power plant. You go away. Mm -hmm. And another <laughs> politician in 2005 finally implemented the power plant with Chinese technology. So Norachole from the day one, a CEB engineer went to the site. Mm. That was a day in 1993. Mm. Until it was completed in 2014, you can count the number of years, two decades. But it should not take so long. No. A large power plant, even if you fast track it, the planning and approval process takes about four years. But doctor, now I read and I hear that in Sri Lanka, the installed capacity, the potential to produce power is way above our actual peak time usage. Now then why are we having power cuts? You are right. You are right. Because Sri Lanka has approximately 4,000 megawatt. Yeah. Sri Lanka's peak demand has just touched 2,700 megawatt. Right. So your requirement is 2,700. Your capacity is 4,000, so what's the problem? So we should have 24-7 power? Yes, but about 1,300 of that capacity is hydro. Okay. So hydro power plants can be run only when water is available. Right. So to preserve hydro power plants to run, the reservoirs must be kept at a higher level. Mm -hmm. So which means as the dry season approaches, you must have other power plants which are adequately cheap and reliable, cheap yeah. and reliable, to ensure that you don't draw down the reservoirs to their rock bottom. Right. So then what happens is, you know, it is happening in several cycles, several cycles starting yeah. from, from about 1980s, 1990s, year 2000 and now as well. Governments come in and they cancel the large power plant projects. Even this government. Well, that why is it? It's so. It's all too easy for me to say that it must be because they couldn't cut the right deal. Uh, I have no That's firm the, evidence to no, no, I, 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 But just, when we look at it, yeah. when we look at it, 
say say Sampur project. Yeah. Sampur project was ready to go for tender on a particular day in 2016, right. and and the day before, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Management makes it not the CEB, not the Energy Minister. Yeah. Cabinet Committee on Economic Management. This is the cabinet within the cabinet that News First has always been. Yes, I have, a, I have a paper cutting from the Sunday Observer. And mind you, it is cancelled on a Sunday because it was to be advertised on Monday for competitive bidding. Right. right? So on Sunday, it is cancelled by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Management. Now, in 1992, yeah. there's a power committee that cancelled the Norachole project. Yeah. In 2002, Energy Supply Committee cancelled the Norachole project. Right. So, so it's, uh, you know, I mean, basically power plants cannot be built by committees. Yes. Power plants have to be built by institutions. Or by friends. Uh, well, <laughs> whether they are friends or not, I do not know. Yeah. But then these are committees that sit out, because I mean, whether we like it or not, Energy Minister is responsible for the sector. Yeah. So when the energy minister is sidelined, the energy secretary is sidelined, yeah. CEB is sidelined, and there is some committee which is all powerful, yeah. manned by officials and behind them are politicians, yeah. they make decisions on technical and economic matters that have very severe consequences on the power sector, and the consequences will not be seen immediately. They will be seen five years later. I just want to stop you there for one second. Mm -hmm. Because when you were saying about these committees making decisions based on technical and professional considerations and that these committees, these political committees, they don't really, they don't, they lack the technical and professional expertise, my mind was suddenly cast towards the Presidential Commission of Inquiry about the bond scan. And at the end of that report, the two judges and the retired Deputy Auditor General, they say, that they do wish that cabinet, parliament, will appoint the right sort of people to look into these matters. These are very technical matters. And it's the same thing you're saying, but the sector is different. But what I'm trying to point out here is that we lack the same thing, be it in the fiscal management of the country, where the committee of two learned judges and a retired deputy Auditor General is saying the same thing that you're saying, and you clearly haven't read this Presidential Commission of Report, Inquiry Report, and so you couldn't have known what was in that report, but I have read it. And you're saying the same thing. It looks to me that this problem where the politicians are trying to play, be the technocrats and the professionals, continues in all different sectors to the detriment of our country's progress. Karas, what happens in India? India is building all different types of power plants. Yeah. Tamil Nadu had their last load shedding in 2015, and now they are power surplus. A state that was eternally having load shedding for the last four decades. They are building coal-fired power plants. There is a big nuclear power plant already operational, and the phase two is being built, and building gas-fired power plants, and building solar and wind as well. So it's a, it's a multiple sources of energy. What happens in India when there is a protest against a power plant? In most situations, the politician doesn't get involved. The right. professionals handle the professional protests because right. you know, some, some uh, concerned environmental institutions may have a genuine, yeah. genuine concern. Yeah. They, file a, they file a court case, they conduct a protest, and it will be professionally handled. Yes. What happens in Sri Lanka? The politician asks the energy secretary to go and tell the judge yeah. that the government has cancelled the project. That's what happened. That's what happens. It happened to Norachal, it happened to Sampur, it will happen to other projects in the future. Not only coal, it can happen to gas-fired power plants as well. It can happen to hydropower plants as well. In Bangladesh, what happens? There is a controversial coal-fired power plant coming up. The Prime Minister herself is campaigning for the project. Whereas there, whereas there is quite a lot of uh, uh, quite a lot of protests, official, unofficial, on the streets against the project, but she tells the international community, "Look, Bangladesh has to develop. This power plant must come in." So Bangladesh is building three large coal-fired power plants at the moment. Now, mind you, Bangladesh is a gas-producing country. Yes. And three large gas terminals at the moment, and yeah. several gas-fired power plants. So, and 
solar as well. So it's not one source of energy that will meet the requirements, but it will be multiple such, such that finally the supply will be reliable to the customer, capacity will be adequate, and most importantly, the price will be competitive. And Sri Lanka doesn't have any of those. And wh what about <coughs> some people say to us that, um, uh, what about furnace oil? What well, is this? Well, it is it is oil anyway. It's a, right. it's a cheaper form of oil. Right. It's a dirtier form of oil in terms of sulfur. It is more damaging than even coal. Okay. So therefore, we should not be using furnace oil. Furnace oil is used in ships, okay. and in fact, worldwide, furnace oil consumption is being reduced. Right. So, so they should not be using. So where you know, look, we all like <laughs> to be eco-friendly. Mm -hmm. We all need to be uh, uh, mindful of the environment and so on. And uh, our dear friend Vidura is, you know, he's, he's very eloquent about this. But that's clean. We, on the one side we have clean energy and on the other side we have the accountants and the money man. So the fiscal side. Where does this twain meet? Where, where, which is the clean but affordably clean energy in terms of Sri Lanka's capacity, financial capacity? Clean where does energy, it meet? Clean energy costs have been coming down recently. Right. So we have to say that very clearly. Right. But there are technical issues yeah. that still prevent us from having a 100% renewable energy system. In fact, worldwide professionals are still debating whether a 100% clean energy power system is viable in the future forever because mm -hmm. of the technical issues. Mm -hmm. So of course a lot of research is going on uh, you know, to find out whether it can be there. Say for example research on batteries, bringing down battery costs, yeah. re because the, the society over here and abroad are used to reliable electricity supply. Right. In a western country the total hours of outage per year is always less than 10 years. This is only for some urgent maintenance. All right. So, so uh, the unreliability of the clean sources of energy also has to be resolved. Right. The cost matter has been, you know, to a certain extent, resolved. But then, to bring in the reliability and the large quantities that you need, we have to look at what other countries are doing and whether Sri Lanka can be significantly different to those countries. What because about this LNG then? All right, so if you want to change the topic to LNG. No, 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 I, yes. I, 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 LNG is, is we are talking about affordable, mm -hmm. clean energy. Yes. So is, uh, where, where is LNG, because you haven't mentioned LNG. LNG in the hierarchy is, I would say, in the third place yeah. of costs. The cheapest being large hydro, right. and the next being coal, yeah. and the third is LNG. Right, so you, the hydro, you can't rely on it because it's water dependent. So it's weather, we can't do anything about that. All right, so then comes coal. Then coal, then, then LNG. You talk about cost, are you? Yes, okay. cost, right. cost. Reliability-wise, coal and LNG can be equal, right? In practical terms, if, if you, it takes a long time to shut down a coal power plant, it takes a long time to restart it. LNG power plant is more flexible, okay. but not as flexible as a hydropower plant. Hydropower plant, you give the start command, within, within two minutes it's producing electricity. Right. So LNG is not so flexible, but not as bad as a coal-fired power plant. Okay. So power plants have to be built to meet the growing demand. So we yeah. were just discussing, yeah. since 2014, no new power plant has entered operation. The, and that last one being the uh, engine no, tree of no, no, Charlie. Charlie. I would have told you today, I would have loved to tell you that don't worry, this crisis is short lived yeah. because Sampur is 90% complete and it will be producing electricity next year. So mm -hmm. please bear with the, bear with CEB. Yeah. But I cannot say that. There because. Is, because there is no significant power plant under construction at the moment. So, so that's it right now. We're like, well, so what happened to this LNG business? For, 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 for several weeks, the media, the press yeah. is full of LNG. Yes. So, LNG is liquefied natural gas. Yeah. So, it has to be imported in a liquid form 
stored in a terminal yeah. and delivered in the ga in the form of gas to a power plant. Okay. So the controversy, cease controversies that you are hearing, yeah. the first controversy is related to the gas import terminal and the second one is related to a power plant. Okay. These are related but two different projects. Okay. So the power plant project, I think it has been discussed and uh, you know exposed in the media quite a lot. I will not get into that. Okay. But then even to run this power plant, which has a name board saying LNG, yeah. we must have LNG. Yeah. We have we have nothing. Yeah. We have we have no terminal, no not even a contract appointed, no site, nothing. So the day, uh, you know, couple of days after Sampur was cancelled. If I was the political authority in this country, if I cancelled the Sampur power plant for whatever reason, I would have started off with a, with a crash program to get LNG into the country. What did the government do? Never called for a competitive bid for a LNG terminal. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, various interested parties started giving proposals to politician number one, another party gives a politician proposal to politician number two, mm. another party politician number three, uh, four parties gave proposals to BOI. Mm. So my count is now seven LNG terminals and its institutions and politicians working against each other mm. to get their, uh, you know, party to get the contract. but mm. but. So when that happens, finally one politician's gas terminal against the other politician's gas terminal means there will be no gas terminal. But if we ask the Petroleum Corporation or some new gas authority or whoever yeah. to call for a competitive bid, there yeah. will be respectable companies bidding for this terminal and we have some hope that there will be a gas terminal. Otherwise, the, so, the, the most controversial so-called LNG power plant will be running on diesel right. because there is no gas. Right. So it uh, looks like at the moment the front runner is the diesel lobbyist. That's, that's how I see it. The winner is the diesel technology. Yeah. Whether there are lobbies behind it, your guess as good as mine. Okay, but <coughs> you know, now I don't want to bring this up, the point is sounding boring and all that. But on the one side, you're, you're talking about, and eventually I suppose what you're talking about is the national, uh, there's the security, the energy security of our country, okay? So then we have this information that a oil refinery is going to be set up in Sri Lanka. Is it a good idea that the Sri Lankan government, the, the, should we have a share in it or should we not have a share in it? That's the first question. Okay, you want my answer? Yeah. Right. Um, the government of Sri Lanka appears to have a policy yeah. in which the government has a share yeah. in most of the energy sector businesses. Right. In fact, the Electricity Act is even more explicit yeah. saying that any large new power plant can be private sector but the government must be given a share of that power plant. Whether right. it is a small share or a big share, Electricity Act is silent about it. Right. Petroleum Act is not so explicit. Mm. So it's a matter for the government to decide considering the national energy security. But my worry for us is a lot deeper than that. Right. We had this, a similar refinery pro proposal for Hambantota in 2002. Right. Don't forget that our refinery is 1969 technology. It produces, Sapugaskanda. Sapugaskanda. Yeah. it produces only one third of the petroleum product requirements of the country. So we, we, at the moment we are supplying 50,000 barrels. 50,000 barrels which is, which, is, which is about one third you know, with the shutdowns etc. So it's about one third to 40 percent is the product requirement that can be provided by the refinery. Right. Petroleum engineers, I've looked at the feasibility study as well, say that if we upgrade our existing refinery or build a new refinery, the country can save $500 million a year. Can we afford to build a new one? Well, the new refinery, the numbers that are being talked of is about, are, are in excess of $3 billion. Yeah. Petroleum engineers tell me that it can be built at less than $2 billion. Okay. Because inflating project costs is also a big game for us. Yeah, so sure. we have to separately talk about it. Yeah. Right? So if we have the Petroleum Corporation in a partnership with another company and call for bids for partnership, and the most important thing is not to run behind these dubious uh, investors 
who themselves say that we are not sure whether we will do it yes. and delay and delay and delay the project to build a new refinery in Sri Lanka. Well, <coughs> well that's right because it, it's raging from one controversy to another. And uh, as you might have uh, guessed by now, the cabinet uh, memorandum talks about a particular company to pursue this project uh, in the, the, the oil refinery. But on the day uh, the cabinet pr memorandum is submitted, that company doesn't even exist in law. So it's some ghost company. As you know for us, the Cabinet Committee on <coughs> Economic Management that cancelled uh, various power plants also does not exist now. So who takes the responsibility? The Cabinet Committee on Economic Management doesn't exist. I, I heard the President you know, <coughs> abolishing the committee and appointing another committee. Yes, because that, that committee was um, uh, sort of a law unto its own self. It was so a committee. Oh, yes, another committee. So, committee. so, so who committee. takes... Who takes responsibility of not building power plants or cancelling power plants? That's my question. So a committee that doesn't exist, that the committee had no status in law, uh, has made these decisions, uh, obviously with the blessings of the political authority or the two political authorities. So there's nobody to take responsibility. I, 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 you know, we can't hold the energy minister responsible. So, so what's the solution? Do we need a strong government? If so, if you're talking about strong government, then... <coughs> Uh, President Rajapaksa had enough of a strong government because he had a huge majority. How he got the majority is a different story, but he had a majority. So then it's the same argument. He said you needed strong government to fight the war. So do we need strong government? He had the strong government, then he didn't solve the energy problem. Or did he? Or is that why we're having? Is it because we've got this government that are not really in the majority, they've got the TNA supporting them, as in when Sumandran thinks about it, or whoever. For us, we are professionals, we don't like to talk about politics and politicians. Yeah. But as an as a independent observer... Yes, but I, as, as yes. independent, as citizen Simula Piti, what would you like to see? You want strong government to solve this problem? What is, what is it? <laughs> In fact, what I would like is to politicians to do their job. That is policy making and making laws. Right. And then allow CEB yeah. and other entities, yeah. the regulatory commission, etc., to do their job. Yeah. So which means the only question as of now, the president should be asking the CEB chairman and the board. First of all, the chairman and the board have to be a professional board. Yeah. They can't be your friend or uh, you know brother-in-law or somebody. They have to be a professional board and give the full responsibility and hold them responsible. Right. That's not happening. Politician wants to make the decision, decisions himself. So, so if we accept that reality, that the politicians make decisions on technical matters, certainly we need a very strong political leadership to make decisions. Number one, to restart Trincomalee coal-fired power plant project. Right. So whether you revive the cancelled project or do another one is a detail, but it has to be done. Then call for proper bids to build one gas terminal in Sri Lanka. This because is Sri Lanka, LNG thing. LNG. Yeah. Build one. You know, Sri Lanka doesn't need seven terminals. India has only four terminals. For the whole of 1.2 right. billion people, India has only four terminals. Sri Lankan politicians are running behind seven proposals. Yes. Right. So, I mean, the respectable terminal builders for LNG in the world must be laughing at Sri Lanka, yeah. right? So, Sri Lanka, you know, tiny, tiny Sri Lanka market does need LNG, is but it only be, one Is terminal. it because they may be thinking of exporting it to South India? No, 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 no. South India is already surplus, electricity surplus. Okay. Right? Well, I'm just trying to give them an excuse. <laughs> no, no way, no way. Uh, so, South India electricity surplus, gas surplus. Yeah. Uh, so, therefore, we need only one terminal. So, uh, strong political authority will call for competitive bids to build the terminal and procure gas on a government to government basis maybe Oman maybe Qatar maybe Australia maybe Malaysia yeah. procure gas on a government to government basis on a long term contract yeah. store in this terminal and provide the gas to the new and upcoming hopefully resolved uh, gas fired power plant in Kerala Pitya and also several power plants that are now running on diesel can be converted to gas operation. I see. So the, the, the need of the hour, very quick, yes. the need of the hour. The need of the hour is to make strong decisions because we seem to be making decisions for the short term. That diesel power plant is ad hoc decision. Ad hoc short term decision. My and recommendation is fragmented. Fragmented decision because we don't know who is actually making decisions. Yeah. 
The correct way is now that we have fallen into this pit, first decision on the long term. Yeah. That is the next coal fired power plant, yeah. very strong decision, accelerated action, gas fired power plants and gas terminal, strong decision, accelerated action. Then of course we have a at least a four year gap to resolve until these bear fruit. Then let us go for un inevitably more and more diesel to resolve the short term problem. So we seem to be doing solutions, ad hoc solution for the short term and not making any decisions. Even after we fell into this situation, no decision of any value has been made about the longer term. Let's see if the new Minister of uh, Power and Energy can, uh, can do it. I think more than whether he can do it, it's a question of time, isn't it? Because now the elections, something called elections are looming. Yeah, of course, uh, there was a change of government in the middle of power cuts in 2001. So the society is not willing to accept, for whatever reason, power cuts and electricity price increases because Sri Lanka's cost of electricity is about 23 rupees yeah. for a unit now, and whereas the price of electricity is 17 rupees. Right. So the government can say, oh, the Treasury will bear this difference. But can oh, we fiscally actually Yeah, manage I mean, uh, Treasury has people's money. So it's a matter of whether you pay this extra cost through your electricity. But they have even less and less, they have even less and less money yeah. because uh, there are other things that come and rob them, uh, <laughs> like this scam and that scam and also. So, uh, oh, I mustn't use the word scam. So, right. so Treasury has people's money. So it's, it's a question of whether you pay your electricity bill truly, the true cost, or you pa pay a part of the electricity bill through the telephone bill because telephone bills are taxed heavily. Okay. So, so I mean, it's just uh, you know fooling the public to 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 make electricity appear to be cheaper. But as long as it is more and more more diesel and more diesel, the cost can only go up and not down. Dr. Tilak Simrapit has been wonderful talking to you. Uh, please come on uh, our longer program like uh, Face the Nation, where you can uh, uh, argue your case, uh, or rather, where you can appeal to the better judgment of some of our. Uh, decision makers to get to grips with this problem of sporadic darkness. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, right. Doctor. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. And that's the way it was on, <coughs> sorry, on Newsline li um, Live. We'll see you again tomorrow. In the meantime, take care, have a great day ahead, and of course, God bless. First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali.